toys. <coughs> but first, do you remember The Graduate? Mrs. Robinson and all that. And do you remember Mr. Maguire, who takes Benjamin aside and says, Benjamin, I've got just one word, one word for you. But if he did it today, it wouldn't be plastics. It would be mobile. It's the biggie. Extraordinary things are happening. And we're just at the beginning of this revolution. And revolution is a word that is overused, but I think in terms of opportunities, there are huge things happening. A tiny bit of homework. You don't have to look too closely at the numbers. Just look at the trend lines. This is how much data we're going to be sending between our devices <coughs> per month in petabytes. It's a billion megs. This is for Cisco, and it looks ahead at device by device how the data tsunami is going to hit. So yes, at the bottom we've got laptops, we've got netbooks, but you've got your gaming systems at home, you've got your tablet devices, you've got machine talking to machine, you've got all sorts things in your cars, sensors in the streets, and it changes behavior. Again, this is another way of looking at it. This is what we're going to be using it for. So yes, an awful lot is going to be video on our mobile phones, but then gaming, just web data is taking off. And that changes both how we talk to each other, the sorts of data we give to organizations as well as our friends and how you can target people on a much more personal level, how you can work out what they want, wherever they are, in real time. And that's transformative. We'll look at a few examples. If you didn't want to concentrate, this is the overall trend, I think you have to remember. And some numbers from um, Kleiner Perkins, which just show how exponential this era is in terms of the number of people, the number of devices. So when mainframe computers came in the 60s, there were about a million of them, bottom left. And the mini computer era, maybe 10 million. PC in the 90s, maybe 100 million. Desktop internet, well that era, it's kind of over because we're now on the mobile internet, but there were about a billion units connected. But already, people are talking about 10 billion units. So you know, adding all these zeros is big news. And you know, if you've got a Kindle, if you've got a fairly recently bought car, home entertainment system, everything is connected. So this idea of the internet being a thing, that's an old concept. You don't talk about air being a thing, you don't talk about electricity being a thing, you talk about you want to access this service. So e-commerce, redundant concept, is just commerce. So this is how we travel, this is packing to go away. And of course, wherever you are, the boss can find you. There's a new expectation, the social contract between employer and employee. They can get you at midnight on a Sunday. They can get you when you're off. So the expectation changes. You're not somebody based in a place, in an office. You're somebody who can always make a decision, come back with feedback. You don't reply to that email within 15 minutes. Are you not concentrating? But there's opportunities to make lots of this because we're at the beginning of a very, very steeply rising curve. And I think it's, um, it's just a couple of numbers already. So three times as many people connected to mobile as to the internet. Whole continents like Africa kind of bypassed the first internet era. But as they upgrade the mobile, to smartphones, the geolocation, with much more contextual awareness. New ways to target consumers, new ways to understand what they want. And it's incredibly powerful. So it's no mistake that that is no longer the richest man in the world. This one is now. Carlos Slim, who made his money out of mobile telecoms. Tommy Ahonen, who consults a lot for the big mobile companies, calls it the fastest growing giant history in the economic history of mankind. So if I were Chief Lot, 
I'd go home and write a business plan involving mobile because I think the door is wide open. If you can take any service with some consumer demand and find a way to reach them wherever they are in that convenient, easy to use way, people are spending money. So let me tell you about my friend Ryan. We're getting onto the psychology now. Some strange things happen. Ryan has connected all his transactional databases, his credit card number, his eBay account, his PayPal account, to a website called Blippi. <coughs> Every time he buys something, it's logged on Blippi and published, and anybody can go and look at it and comment on it. So Ryan bought a T-shirt. It appeared on Blippi. He bought some dental floss. It appeared on Blippi. Um, and I looked at it a couple of months ago, and I saw he bought a gun. Now, Ryan is in California, where they do this sort of stuff. Um, but his Glock 23, it's actually pretty cheap, $43. But what's more interesting is, A, he told, he told everybody else about it, and B, they all had an opinion. They start commenting. And I said to him, Ryan, this is kind of weird. Why would you want to tell people this? It's kind of a private thing, what you buy. And he said, no, I love it. I love the fact that it makes me feel important. Um, it's the most honest way I can express my interests and values. I get validation through my peers. I get validation even through strangers. And it's also changing his own purchasing intentions. So there's the influence of that social graph he's created through Blippi. If one of his close friends watches a film, he'll go and want to watch that film. He's influenced by that. Or he likes the fact that other people are recommending things to him. That's not what advertising ever did. <coughs> so, we live in this virtual world for a lot of our lives. We play games. This is a virtual casino game. You play it on your iPhone, it's free to download. You can pay a little bit of money to personalise your corner of the casino. So the guy who owns this company, Shervin Peshawar, the social gaming network, was telling me there's one lady who's just spent $40,000 personalising her corner of this virtual game. But it made complete sense to him. You know, she spends a lot of time on this game. She's got a lot of friends who also play. She might not have met them. But it gives her a kind of reputational boost. She impresses them. They talk about her. Strangely illogical, but emotionally and psychologically, I think you can start to understand what's going on. There's another game called Project Entropia, and this is a virtual nightclub in Project Entropia. <coughs> Somebody sold it last year. $635,000 for a bunch of pixels. It's extraordinary, but it's happening now. I don't know if any of you played Pet Society. It's a British startup called Playfire. Every day, they're saying there are 90 million virtual transactions in that game. Again, people spending money on pixels. I guess you sold the most roses on Valentine's Day last year. It wasn't a florist. It was an app. It's automatic. Because you can pay you know, a dollar or a pound to send a bit of love to someone through a virtual rose kind of crazy. Nobody would have predicted this. So one of the things we're doing more and more is giving a bit of ourselves to the network, sharing. And we're doing it partly for reputation, partly because as long as the platform creates the conditions for social, socially good behavior, um, we behave well. Pierre Omidyar, the founder of eBay, famously said, I think people are actually basically good and I'm going to show that. And most of the time on eBay, things work. Very rarely do you get ripped off. Um, so we all know about the obvious, the Wikipedia sharing. But there's the same trend hitting every sector at the moment. I'll give you a couple of examples. Medicine. People who have illnesses are now logging onto websites like this. This is a network called Patients Like Me, where there's about 100,000 people 
with 500 odd conditions and they're sharing their own reactions to medications and they're trying to improve everybody's outcome through data. So one of the worst conditions um, people on the site have is called ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. It's a muscle wasting disease. You don't have a very long life expectancy, three, maybe five years at the most. And there's no cure for it. And there was one drug used, Ruluzole, that um, was accepted to slow down the development. But it was bad news until about three years ago, a group of Italian researchers published a finding in one of the journals that if you give people lithium, that can really make a difference and slow down the disease. And the only problem was they did a sample of just 16 people in that test, which scientifically is not that credible. So patients like me thought, let's verify this. Let's get our community sharing their own data. Let's set up our own experiment. So they got about 3,000, 3,500 people with ALS. And I think 150 of them started taking lithium. And they monitored the progress. And they found it made absolutely no difference. There wasn't even a placebo effect. And they published this in a scientific journal, Nature Biotechnology. Now those people, for no financial benefit, just to share goodwill and knowledge, boosted science that little bit. There's another website, this one's called Cure Together, doing similar things. They did a really interesting experiment last year. Over a year, about 5,000 people with depression monitored and shared what treatments worked for them and what didn't. So this is a little scatter diagram showing on the rising line on the left the effectiveness of the treatment and on the horizontal how popular it was. So it turns out, based on real people sharing their real research, that if you're depressed, exercise and a good night's sleep, and things like art therapy and music therapy are a lot more effective than some of the prescribed drugs. And then don't even think about alcohol as a way of feeling better because that can make you worse. And caffeine isn't that good and forget fish oil and so on. So again, it's all for the public good. And you can make cars through a network. Is there a volume switch? Smartest, most talented person in the world, it would still be really hard for you to make a new original car. Now you can. Join the members co-creative team to help create, develop, build, and bought brand new cars. Here's how it works. First, join the community and everyone is invited. Next, create new cars or help develop ongoing concepts. If you're a hot designer, create your cars by participating in a competition or submit a design to check up or review. If you love cars, vote to decide what will be developed. All designs are protected with a Creative Commons license to promote collaboration, but protect your design ownership. The concepts with the most votes are developed in co-creation. Co-creation is working with your peers and the local owner's team to help choose things like the body and interior details and components like engines and shocks. You help develop the car and ensure it turns out the way you want. Once a car is fully developed, you can buy it and build it. Local Motors opens a micro factory in your region to build the cars you want to build. For example, Local Motors opened a micro factory in Phoenix to build the Rally Fighter. There are many more micro factories to come and more cars to build. So far, the LM Extreme is the most popular in the Carolinas, the Green Apple is favored in Manhattan, and the Boston Bullet in Boston. Microfactories mean local jobs and the most convenient service. The microfactory model is also sustainable. Since cars are built one at a time, there is less waste. Plus, local motors businesses allow the use of locally available fuel sources and more rapid adjustment to changing technology. Not only can you be proud of building your own car, you can be proud of buying local. Your car is special because you make it. You can even design or choose a custom car skin for the body. Every car is numbered. Only 2,000 of each design will ever be made. 
It only takes two three-day weekends to build your car in a Local Motors microfactory. Local Motors provides you all the help you need, but you are the lead builder. You can even bring someone to enjoy the experience with you. At the end of the second weekend, you drive your car home. With a new understanding of how your car works, you are a better, safer driver. So when you complete the building of your own car, you join the ranks of the most responsible car owners in America. Once the car is home, you can mod it. All chassis and body data is available. Modders, fabbers, and manufacturers, click the download button to retrieve all the data you need to build anything for the rally fighter. You can even sell what you build through the look. That's a real car now. You can make it for about $55,000. I love the fact that the crowd is designing a car, deciding which cars are going to win, and then making it. If you can do that to the car industry, you can do it to anything. Here's another example of the crowd sharing in real time. Um, this is an Israeli company called Waze, W-A-Z-E. If you sign up to the network, you connect your mobile device to the network, and wherever you are in traffic, tells the network the traffic conditions, how fast you're going and you can annotate it, you can tell them if there's a police trap ahead. This is Los Angeles over a 24-hour period. Um, again, you benefit by sharing, but there's a multiplier effect. You create something useful for the whole network. There's a real boom at the moment in sharing personal assets, including homes. So you want to make a bit of money out of your home, Originally there was couch, share, couch surfing where you give somebody a spare sofa for the night and now there's a network of commercial sites like Airbnb and people in New York renting out a sofa or a spare room are making some of them an average of about $2,000 a month of spare money. I think I talked last time I was here in September about a peer-to-peer -peer car rental service called Whipcar where if you Think about how much you spend on a car. It's your second biggest asset, typically, after your house. But it's idle for 90% of the time. You can log it into the network, and if somebody wants to borrow it, they'll pay you whatever you ask. And the company's insurance, Whipcar's insurance, supersedes yours, so the risk is minimized. There's a huge boom in this sort of thing. Um, if you have a creative project, you go to a site like Kickstarter and say, would you share the financial risk? I'd like to make a film. I'd like to design a watch. So these guys wanted to design a watch where the face was actually an iPod Nano. They thought they'd need about $15,000. The community loved it so much that 13,500 people pledged real money and they got almost a million dollars and they're making a TikTok and lunatic watch as a going concern. Um, my favorite example at the moment of sharing, because it leads to all sorts of extraordinary things, is sharing our DNA. So there's a California company, 23andMe, where typically for a couple of hundred dollars, you can get this little plastic tube sent to you. You fill it with saliva, send it back, and five or six weeks later, it gives you an incredibly detailed list on a web page of your risk for all sorts of medical conditions. It also tells you where your family originated based on your father and your mother's gene haplotype. Then it tells you we have 991 people in our database who are related to you. And it breaks them down into seven cousins because you shared great-grandparents. Third cousins. Um, so I tried this quite recently. And I looked at, you get a personal inbox. And I got a bunch of emails in there. And one of them typically said, hello, I'm Alison. We share 1.6% of our DNA on six strands. <laughs> I think we could be related. Do you want to chat? <laughs> so, you know, sorry, Alison, I've got enough trouble with the LinkedIn updates and the Facebook friend requests. I'm not going to jump into a social network where you're sharing DNA knowledge. But again, all this information collectively will help everything from if you need you know, bone marrow donors to understand particular illness outcomes. Um, other things people are sharing. Sleep patterns. So you can buy this device called the Zio, put it on your pillow. It tells you your sleep patterns. You get your own personal web page. It wakes you up at the optimal time and so on. Um, you get this lovely data. You can share it with whoever you want. You can spot patterns. You can work together. 
there's a lot of kind of Darwin, I think, in all this sharing this. Um, an interesting book by this evolutionary psychologist, Jeffrey Miller, that says um, a lot of what we're doing in the public sphere, especially our purchasing decisions, is there to show essentially how virile we are, how evolutionarily valuable we are, why we'd be better kids, better parents to your kids, and so on. Um, and it connects also with this game psychology, which we're seeing a lot more of. Some of you may play this. 200 million minutes of Angry Birds are played every day, which I calculated meant every hour 16 years of Angry Birds being played. But it's moving to other industries, this game psychology. So this is the dashboard for the Prius car, which is designed to create a kind of personal competition to try and make you brake more efficiently to use less energy. You get you know, your own graph, and you do start to want to be <coughs> less wasteful. So I run with an app called RunKeeper. It tracks me during using GPS, gives me all sorts of metrics, all sorts of numbers, you know, how many calories it thinks I've burned. You get your own web pages. I got an email from RunKeeper two weeks ago. Hey David, congratulations. April was your best month ever. <laughs> now I know it was a machine, but I felt fantastic. I was on a high all the day. And I thought, I'm going to make sure May is even better than April. And it works. You get better performance by creating a set of targets. And you hear a lot of this word, gamification, which is going into education, it's going into medical training. If you can find a way to make people compete against themselves, against other people, you can create better outcomes. They will learn more efficiently. They will change their behavior. So according to some survey, you know, half of businesses are already looking to gamification for the next couple of years to get more innovative products and processes. So commerce is the big one. How the peer-to-peer, -peer, the social connections, the psychology are affecting what we buy and channeling our purchasing decisions. And there's a whole bunch of things from these flash sales where we invite our friends to join the select group invited in. There are these apps like Sticky Bits where there's a barcode stuck on a wall somewhere and anybody who comes past can use their cell phone to scan in the barcode add extra information if there's a bargain at a shop you want to tell people about. This is like Blippi, it's Swipely. Again, you swipe your purchasing cards. They call it, they call it turning purchases into conversations. Many of you probably are having teeth whitening every two or three hours. <laughs> the one thing they are going to do is improve British dentistry, I think. But again, the model is share it with your friends, you get a discount. And they know more about who your friends are. They know what your personal interests are. You're going to get a lot more targeting based on what you've responded to. And of course, it works in real time and location. At one stage with this, they had 10 deals a second on a gap deal. So Andrew Mason, the founder, um, I heard speak a couple of days ago in Paris, he is pretty blunt about it. You know, middle class people, sit around trying to think how to make how to spend money. One of the most powerful ways to figure that out is looking at what your friends are buying, people you trust. Real world social connections, just online, makes it more efficient as a way to find them. So there's some really innovative uses of this technology. This is life changing. If you've ever been in the changing room, don't know whether to get the blue top or the red top, and your partner isn't there, what do you do? You take a photo, you upload it to go try it on, and in real time the community votes. You should get the blue one. It looks much better on you. And there are all these sorts of online communities which decide on you know, the perfect outfit based on images people have found online. Again, it's fashion creation collectively. And it's affecting lots of people, particularly younger people's purchasing decisions. It's what the crowd says is cool. And then there are these video haulers, they're called on YouTube. These girls who talk about what they bought that week. This one, I think, 
when I last looked, had something like 130 million views. Batty, but we're influenced by it. And of course, the people who do share seem to spend more money on purchases. They're more engaged. So you kind of want to tap into those people if you have a product to sell. So this man is quite key to all this, the 27-year-old. Um, this is his next big mission, social commerce. And he's talking about social design for business. He's talking about getting every business to redesign themselves socially. So already, there's about two and a half million companies that have incorporated the Facebook like. And if you're on Facebook on average, I think it's nine times a week you're liking something. Um, and of course, we're accessing via our mobile device, and we're really engaged if we're doing that. Um, but it means we're telling people what we like. Many of them are people we know in real life, and it's influencing them. So the ticketing website, Eventbrite, worked out if you share something on Facebook, it generates like five or six times as much revenue as if you do it on Twitter. <coughs> So really, you're getting retailers setting up store inside Facebook. Um, ASOS has, I think, 150,000 products you can buy through their Facebook store. You're going to see a lot more of this because it increases revenue. Social plus commerce is big. Um, Christian Hernandez runs the international sales side of Facebook. It's the advertiser's holy grail. How does my brand money lead to foot traffic? You can finally figure out the return from what you spend on advertising. So that's why Facebook is getting into local, via geolocation, it's Facebook places. You check into the store using your app, special offers, because it works. I mentioned mobile a bit earlier, how you're going to become billionaires. Um, I don't know how many people have checked in here on Foursquare today. Who is the mayor of the NFT? Okay, so it's again, it's a game. You tell someone, you tell the network, you tell your friends where you are. The one who checks in the most becomes the mayor of that place. Completely pointless, boasting power, but you get badges. If you go to too many bars, you get the bender badge. If you check in with many members of the opposite sex, you get the player badge. You get offers targeted to you, which is American Express did something with Foursquare. Um, and being on the move is key because in the last quarter, for the first time ever, smartphones and tablets <coughs> outsold desktop PCs for the first time, way ahead of prediction. So we are now officially in the mobile era, but we're just at the beginning. Um, and this is a phrase you should use at dinner parties to sound really clued in. Um, it's coined by a venture capitalist, John Durr, in the Valley. Solomo. Social plus local plus mobile is what he says is the key to the next fortunes on virtual gifts. Crazy, but here. Um, Dan Ariely, who wrote Predictably Irrational, um, is worth reading on this. The behavioral psychology, it's all about purchase as a trigger to identity. He says, when you own a product, there's something called the endowment effect. You want to tell people about that. It's part of you, and you overemphasize how good it is. You have loss of them. You don't like losing things. So what you have, you create a higher set of values about. And of course, personal reputation becomes a, an online commodity that is incredibly useful and key to how we see ourselves. So there are sites like Clout and Peer Index where you get a number, a score, your personal reputation. So my friend Gerald got 45 for his cloud score, but I'm very proud that I beat him because I got 54. That's nowhere near most of the people I'm following on Twitter. But it tells you who's following you and how you're influencing other people. And it's quite addictive. It's strangely compelling. Um, people rank rather than page rank. You can now identify the most influential people in a space, so traditional marketing is over. Um, and an example of strange things that are happening, this is Nicholas Christakis who wrote a book last year called Connected. I 
about the power of social networks, how if you're in a network with people who smoke, you're more likely to be influenced to smoke. Um, the actress Alyssa Milano, who has a million plus followers on Twitter, tweeted a really positive review of his book and the Amazon link, and he thought, hey, I'm gonna sell lots of books. And in fact, in the next 24 hours, he sold fewer books than on average day, and he thought, why is this? She's reaching a million people. So he did a little experiment. He thought, maybe it's the wrong type of person who's following her. So he got Tim O'Reilly, who runs tech conferences. He's quite geekish. as an experiment to tweet a similar review and a link. And, you know, the next day he sold maybe one or two more books than normal, but nothing major. But then Susanna Fox, who runs the Pew um, American Life Internet Research Study, who's got about 4,000 followers, joined in the experiment and tweeted. And they sold three or four extra copies that day. And he concluded, so it's not mass connection online. It's about people you actually have contact with in real life who are influenced online to make those decisions. It's those real world human connections. And then there's peer-to-peer -peer hitting industry by industry. If you want to lend money to people on the other side of the world, there's Kiva. 1% default rate, you get your money back. You don't make money profit, but you get your money back. There's peer-to-peer -peer banking. In Kenya, there's a system called M-Pesa. You exchange money through your mobile phone. 30% of the GDP of Kenya is now transacted through this system. Peer-to-peer t-shirt -peer design. If you go to Threadless, people vote on which t-shirt slogans they like. Actually, I quite like this one. Rock is dead, and paper killed it. It's quite geekish. Um, so this era of sharing that we're only at the beginning of, it's going to change what we consume. So, you know, flip forward the app that creates a magazine based out of the links through your social sites, quite compelling. It's coming to TV. The big challenge for TV companies is how they can integrate social with broadcast. Um, and it's coming to physical goods because 3D printing is about to hit the mainstream where you can customize products. A friend of mine runs a company called Digital Forming in London. You can customize your iPhone case. But not just that. Other companies are customizing clothes, shoes designed to fit you, 3D scans of your body. So the machine that can print, not just in plastic, but in all sorts of fabrics and metals, London company called Within Technologies, they make engine parts that they design on the computer to be ultra light, the Formula One cars, and they print very, very fine grade. They also print medical grade titanium spinal implants, again, designed to be incredibly light, but they can be used inside the body. So 3D printing, where well, you can help co-design things, just about that. So, what does all this mean? How do you become that billionaire? So the big investors in the West Coast see <coughs> infinite potential. And every site that has transactions is going to have to be part of this. Index ventures. When you go to check out, the end of that activity is sharing what you've purchased with friends. Everything is going to have to integrate a social layer in commerce. No question. Facebook. 90% of purchases have a social influence. It's that girls in the mall effect on a large scale, and it's a huge and untapped opportunity. Um, so really brands are doing lots of this on Facebook, but we're going to see a lot more experiments and a lot more opportunity. One survey, pretty soon 15% of consumer spending in the West will go through social networking sites. So I suppose you could say that we're not going to be searching for products and services they'll be finding us. Um, but before I go, the toys. Um, we talked about data and sharing data. I get some interesting things coming into my office. One of them is about sharing medical data. And then a French company called Why Things is making products like this. This is just down to, it's a blood pressure monitor that plugs into your iPhone and takes medical quality 
heartbeat blood pressure. And you get your own personal web page, and you can choose who to share it with. So you can share it with your GP. And it's about a hundred and something pounds, just out. And it's extraordinary, because I'm now experimenting on myself. If you have a coffee, a really strong espresso, your blood pressure does shoot up. Um, <laughs> and then my favorite new toy is um, there's a company in California called Neurosky, which makes this headset that reads a couple of brain signals. It's about a hundred dollars. It's just hit the market and it's a consumer device. And I will see if I have any signal. I might not do. It reads at the front of your brain, the frontal lobe, um, how relaxed you are and whether you're concentrated. <laughs> and I was on stage with the chief executive recently. I don't know if it's going to work. But you get these sorts of graphs. I don't think I'm clinically alive at the moment. <laughs> Um, you can see how relaxed he was when I was asking him questions, and it went, you know, bright red to see he was a bit stressed, and when he got into his long answers, it went green and relaxed. Um, so these are cheap consumer items that are very high-powered, that link to an online database, that just look ahead a bit where things are going to go. How are we going to be sharing information with machines? You know, our car will know if we're too tired to drive, because there'll be a sensor. Interesting times. Um, anybody who wants their blood pressure or brain quality measured, I'll be here for a bit. Thank you very much.